Good morning students. Welcome to the class of Foundations of Cognitive Robotics. We are looking for the neural networks inside the brain in this second week lecture. And now we will look into the basic system that actually builds this network. That means we will look into the configurations, uh, the characteristics of the building block of the brain and the central nervous system which is the neuron itself. So today our focus will be on neuron. When we have discussed earlier, we also told you that there are two approaches to the brain body problem. In one approach, we say that the brain is the fundamental of uh, all the processings and the cognitive behavior, hence the focus has to be on the brain. On the other hand, we have also talked about another group of thought where it is the periphery, it is the dynamic systems that constitutes the body and that actually influences, influences the brain, that was the thought process. Now, one thing that is common between both of them is that in both the cases, the answer is in terms of the neurons and their formations of networks. So, before concentrating on any one type of these systems, we have to understand about this fundamental building block or the neurons uh, of a living system. Now, when we talk about neurons, if you remember that we have talked about central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. We have talked about that how the brain and the you know spinal cord itself. Uh, so, how these are the regions that uh, the part of the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord and how the other parts. Uh, are like the part of the peripheral nervous system, for example, the spinal nerve, the cranial nerves, etc. Now, in one thing that is common in both the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system is the neurons. Of course, the neurons are having different characteristics in these different systems. So, that is what we are going to have a look into it. So, when we try to subdivide neurons uh, in terms of the nerve cells, uh, there are actually three major functional categories are there. The sensory neurons, the motor neurons and the interneurons. Now sensory neurons actually carry information from the body's peripheral sensors into the nervous system for the purpose of uh, perception, motor coordination, etc. So, if you just go back to the slide, you would see that these are the things from which the sensory neurons are bringing these uh, sensory feedbacks and they are, uh, they are putting those things into the uh, nervous system, into the central nervous system. So, that is the sensory neurons. Sometimes we also call them as the afferent neurons. Uh, afferent means something which is carrying towards the central nervous system and it applies to all information that is reaching the central nervous system from the periphery whether or not this information leads to sensation. Now the other one that is from the brain to the uh, muscles these are actually uh, you know functionally these are something which the motor neurons take care of and these are the efferent neurons. So, afferent neurons and efferent neurons. Afferent means going inward and efferent is coming back outward. So, they carry the commands from either the brain or the spinal cord. So, if you look back again that either the brain or the spinal cord sends back the commands in some of these nerves and these are the efferent nerves which are the motor neurons. Now, there are some 
which are neither at the receptors uh, or nor connected to the muscles. They are in between and they actually make connections sometimes between the sensor to the motor neuron, sensor neuron to motor neuron or maybe sensor neuron to another sensor neuron or motor to motor. So these are called interneurons and they are in fact the most numerous and they are subdivided into two classes, the relay type and the local type. The relay or the projection interneurons, they have long actions and convey signals over considerable distance from say one brain region to another. Local interneurons, they have short actions because they form connections with nearby neurons in local circuits. So these are the four sensory neurons, motor neurons and interneurons. So now that we know functionally that there are these sensory neurons, motor neurons and interneurons, we would like to see that what is common in all these neurons. And we would like to see that in all these neuronal structures, what are the issues that one has to look at. As neurons are the building block, our brain actually organizes all the perceptions, be it in terms of storing in the memory or be it in terms of immediate behavioral responses and these are accomplished by the neurons itself. And there are very large number of these neurons that are presented in our brain which is in the range of about 10 to the power 11 neurons. So, uh, you know, th this are, these are huge, mind-boggling numbers of these neurons and they are of different types, at least a thousand different types of neurons you will find in the brain itself. These neurons, as I have just now told you that there are a huge number of neurons that are present in the human brain itself and if you look at it, in different types of species, starting from the lower order species to the higher order, you would see that one of the things that distinctly distinguishes between the species or as we are actually upgrading the species and that is in terms of the total number of neurons that is one and the second point is in terms of the number of connections or the synaptic joints that these neurons make. So let us look into it how this number of neurons or the synaptic connections they actually change as we take our journey from the lower order systems to higher order system. Uh, if we look into the brain neurons from lower to higher order, let us say we start with the roundworms, it has about 302 neurons and about 7500 synapses. If you think of jellyfish, it is you know some order of magnitudes higher about 5600. For snails, it will be about 11000 neurons. For fruit fly, it is huge 250,000. For frogs, now we will be talking about in terms of millions, about 16 millions. And for a house mouse, it will be about 71 millions. When you come to a bird, for example, flinch, this is about 131 millions. So this will start to go towards the billions. And the same thing is true for the parakeets also, that this will be also having in terms of about a billion or so. So you can see that how as we are going from the uh, you know lower order to the higher order you can see that how these uh, uh, you know as the order is actually becoming higher and higher order the number of neuron is actually increasing okay number of neuron has a increasing trend and that's also true for the number of synapses because you can see that for round worm there is only about 7500 synapses whereas for fruit fly uh, you know already it is so high and then for a simple thing like a mouse it is even higher. So the synapses also actually increase as the number of neurons increase the synapses also 
increase. If you look at even higher animals, let us say if you look at uh, elephant for example, you would see that this will be having about uh, 251 billion brain neurons. If you look at uh, say for example marmosets, sets, it has much less total number of neurons. Monkey is about 6 billion, gorilla is about 33 billion, chimpanzee is about 22 billion and for humans they are having 86 billion. Now one interesting thing to note is that the total number of neurons for a human is much less in comparison to the uh, elephant. This is you can see that is 86 billion for human the total number of neurons whereas for elephant it is 251. Of course you have to consider that the size of an elephant is much bigger than the man. So it is not just the total number of neuron that would actually signify the level of intelligence. For that you have to measure the number of neurons in the cerebral cortex itself. In the cerebral cortex elephant is having only 5.6 billion neuron. Gorilla is having about 9.1 billion neuron and human beings are having about 16.3 billion neuron. So it is this high presence of uh, the neurons you can see it is very very high is the highest so it's a high presence of these neurons in the cerebral cortex that actually signifies the intelligence in the system so far we have discussed about the total number of neurons their presence uh, in terms of different types of living systems and now we will focus into each single neuron in a system. When we look into this we will see that there are certain important aspects of a neuron that we need to look into. Now not all the issues we will be covering in this lecture but I will first make you aware of the issues that are related to these neuronal single neurons, you know, what are the issues that are important for it. There are five basic issues of a neural network. The structural component of an individual cells, then the mechanisms by which the neurons produce signals within and between the nerve cells. The patterns of connections between nerve cells and between nerve cells and their targets, muscles and gland effectors, relationship of different patterns of interconnection to different types of behavior, and finally, how neurons and their connections are modified by the experience, different experiences that we gather, how it is. Now, this is a fast subject on its own. So, what we will be covering basically right now is the structural components of individual nerve cells and also in the subsequent lecture the mechanisms by which neurons produce signals within and between the nerve cells. If you look at a typical neuron, you would see that it consists of four important parts. What are these four important parts? Well, first of all, there is a cell body and secondly, there are these regions which are the dendrites. There are two types of dendrites. Some dendrites actually go out from a process and then these are the apical dendrites. Some dendrites are directly from the cell body or the soma, then they are called the basal dendrites. Now, then we have the most important thing that is the action. So, this is what is the action region, that is the action region and finally, the actions aimed at certain interesting points which are called synaptic terminals and there can be many, many synaptic terminals as we have seen earlier that in different, you know, number of neurons can have 10 times, 1000 times, million times, you know, connections in terms of the synaptic, uh, you know, synapses of the neurons. Now, 
basically in this whole system the center of attraction will become the action because it can convey electric signals over distances ranging from 0.1 mm to 2 meter. These signals which are also known as action potentials are initiated at a specialized trigger region near the origin around this point these signals are triggered. So, this is what of course is the configuration of a typical neuronal system. Now, uh, there are actually many differences between different neuronal systems. There are some of the other points also which we will later on talk about. As you can see that in this the blue regions there, these are giving you actually the myelin covers and between these covers you have the node of RANV and you can see the myelin seed in the blue regions. Okay? So, between that you can see the nodes of RANV. They actually together form a very important part in terms of the mechanism by which the action potentials actually travel. Okay? So, the signals are gathered from different dendro, you know, dendrites essentially and they are integrated in the soma once they cross a particular value, then only the triggering occurs and the signal starts to travel. And then the signal reaches to each one of these synapses. Again, these synapses beyond a certain region, they actually carry the signal to the next neuron. And that is how this whole thing. And this next neuron, this, are the, this is the presynoptic neuron, the top part. And the next parts after the synapse is the post synaptic part. So, this is the a, a typical neuronal system from one neuron to the other neuron. Now, if you look at the types of neurons, you would see that the common description that I have so far told you, there are certain finer variations of it. For example, the first variation is in terms of the unipolar neurons. Now, unipolar means that it is having only one process in it. That means only one connections from the cell body and part of it is related to action and the other part is related to the dendrites. So, that is what is the unipolar uh, neuronal cells. Now, this is one of the simplest cells and this is something that you will usually see in the invertebrates. For vertebrates, Unipolar systems you will see mostly in the autonomic nervous system. If you remember that I have talked about sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves and there are these sympathetic nerves which directly controls the breathing, the heart rates, etc. So, this is where the autonomic nervous system where you will, this is one of the primitive part of the human body where you will see the unipolar neurons that are present in the system. Sometimes you will see that uh, not like you know from a single soma you are having only one process that is coming out in terms of action and dendrons, but there are more than one processes that are coming out. So, if there are two of them that comes out then it, it will become bipolar system and if there are many then it will become multipolar uh, system. Let us look into these different types of systems as well. Now, we will look into what we call the bipolar neurons. So, these are the bipolar neurons. For the bipolar neurons, it has an oval soma and as you can see that there are uh, two different parts, two different processes. So, the dendrites are coming and uh, in one uh, part they are joining in the same body and the other part is from where the action is triggering and taking the signal out. So, because of these two uh, polar parts, this is the bipolar configuration. Many sensory cells are actually bipolar. For example, sensory cells from retina, from olfactory epithelium of the nose, they are actually bipolar in nature. Now, if you look into more complicated neurons, then you would see that there are some neurons which are not exactly bipolar. They initially start with a bipolar configuration, but this is what we call them to be pseudo unipolar system. So, for pseudo unipolar system, there is this dendrites, 
there is this uh, peripheral action to uh, you know and then uh, the signal is coming here but instead of having a different pathway you can see that this is where is this outer action central actions going to the action terminals and both of them are joined to the cell body through a single process that's why it is called a pseudo unipolar that is other than these they are actually of two types now these cells develop initially as bipolar cells but the two cell process actually fuse into a single continuous structure that emerges from a single point in the cell body. We also have systems like multipolar neurons. So as the name suggests that it will be having many different processes, you can see that here, here uh, particularly you know, whenever you will be having basal dendrites, you will see many of such things. So here as well as here. And this is where is the actual part and there are many inputs that are coming into it. So these are actually multipolars, many inputs taken by it. Now this is a very common type of a neuron in the, in the case of vertebrates and they vary greatly in shape, especially the length of the action part that actually greatly varies depending on the size of the uh, living beings etc and also in terms of the extents, dimensions, intricacy of the dendritic branching. Usually the extent of branching correlates with the number of synaptic contacts that uh, they will be having. For example, if you are talking about a spinal motor neuron, then there is a relatively lower number of dendrites like something like 10,000 contacts and uh, out of which about 1000 could be on the cell body and 9000 could be with the dendrites. But if you look at the dendritic tree of a Purkinje cell, uh, then uh, which is in the cerebellum part, then it is much larger and bushier and it can receive as many as million contacts. So depending on which region of the brain they are, you will see the number of synopsis for a multipolar neurons will actually change. These are some of the variations. So, for example, this is the, for the hippocampus. We have earlier talked about hippocampus. The neurons in the hippocampus are something like these pyramidal cells. And you can see that they are having so many basal dendrites uh, directly from the soma itself. Also, they have a few apical dendrites and then it has the action. And this, uh, in fact, uh, phenomenally increases even more for the Purkinje cell of cerebellum. As you can see that there is a huge number of synapses. You, you have to keep in your mind that cerebellum is something which is used for many kind of learned, uh, you know, uh, procedural memory related to it, uh, the motions, movements uh, related to that you know, something that we, for example, learn in terms of uh, particular behavior, motion, or any dynamic behavior. So you can easily imagine that how many neural connections are required for such a system. Now, this is what is, uh, that's uh, the Purkinje cell of a typical cerebellum system. So these are the variants of multipolar systems. It's very interesting to note that it's not just the neurons that actually develop a nervous system like the brain and other central nervous systems etc. There will be neurons which will be accompanied with something which is uh, you know very extensively uh, abundant in the system. Uh, when we talk about the brain system for example it will be 80 percent of it will be this type of cells and these are called glial cells. The role of these glial cells is that they actually uh, complement and they try to supplement the, uh, the neurons in terms of uh, supplying say for example nutrition to the neurons, in terms of absorbing uh, the additional potassium and also sometimes the neurotransmitters, uh, excess neurotransmitters. So they uh, uh, they try to actually keep the neurons in a healthy level, immune from their diseases 
and also help them in terms of you know facilitate them in terms of the neural transmission so that you know, we will look into this uh, has a very important role in terms of developing the uh, neural network so we will look into the glial cells now. to look into the glial cells as i told you that their basic role is actually to support the nerve cells and they greatly outnumber the neurons they are 2 to 10 times more glia than neurons in the vertebrate central nervous system and this name glia actually in gr greek it means glue they do not glue as such but they actually glue themselves with the each one of the individual nerve cells and they surround the cell body the action sometimes the dendrites and they also greatly differ from the neurons morphologically because they do not have things like dendrites or actions now glia also differ functionally because even though they arise from the same embryonic precursor cells they do not have the same membrane properties like neurons for example they are not electrically excitable and they are not directly involved in electrical signal they are indirectly involved and uh, there are many interesting variations of that actions that we will see there are different variations of glial cells of course for example we have oligodendrocytes that's one type the oligodendrocytes and then squam cell and then the astrocytes now both oligodendrites and the squam cell their role is in terms of actually giving this myelin covers and they are something you know which are uh, part of the micro uh, glands in fact there are some macro glands uh, uh, macro glands these are part of the macro glands all three of them in fact there are some micro glands also i have not shown them here they actually help the neural network system in terms of immunity etc now as you can see that the main role of both of these two types of uh, macro glands is to give this layer of myelin cover so you can see that they actually cover the action so that is very important because wherever the cover is not there you have the nodes of ran va okay the nodes of ran va now this cover actually is uh, you know it helps in terms of the action potential the traveling of the action potential in terms of the speed it actually increases the speed uh, you know uh, because it actually gives a coverage insulating cover of the action layer so uh, it actually helps in terms of the action potential we will discuss about it in the mechanism part so it helps the traveling speed in terms of increasing the traveling speed of the action potential now there are also another group of glial cells called astrocytes they both actually keep uh, these things with the capillaries and as well as with the nodes of ranvias as you can see from a typical neuron you know they keep contacts of both of them and because they have these starry shapes that's why they are these astrocytes uh, that's the name of this so they also work in terms of uh, giving supplying nutrition and also absorbing some of the things uh, from the neuron itself so in terms of the role of this astrocyte glial cells they of course uh, they help in terms of separating the neural cells that is one and thereby they can insulate the neuronal groups and the synaptic connections but also astrocytes are highly permeable to potassium ions so they help to regulate the potassium concentration in the space between the neurons as you know that during the action potential travel potassium flow is controlled very heavily the potassium goes out of the action and uh, astrocytes basically reserve this potassium uh, flow and then supply the potassium so repetitive uh, firing of these is firing of uh, the system they actually may create excess extracellular uh, potassium you know firing of the actions and that is something which could otherwise interfere with the signaling between cells 
and that's where the glial cells uh, come in terms of a rescuer because it absorbs this additional excess potassium. That is one important role. They also help in important housekeeping chores that promote efficient signaling between neurons. For example, uh, they take up the neurotransmitters also from the synaptic zones after release. And sometimes they also release the growth factors. So thus glial cells, they actually, uh, they have a very much complementary role in terms of the neural transmission. We have seen the basic morphology of a neuron. Now we will try to understand that how this neuron works in a, uh, in, in a, in a complete system. Ref, let's say the easiest of it is uh, in terms of a reflex system. So we will try to see that how in a reflex system the afferent neurons, let's say you know uh, there are pressure receptors in our hand. So if I press it the afferent neurons are going to actually take the signals towards the motor. And in some cases, you are going to see that uh, there is a reflex action that is happening to the system. So we will try to explain the uh, neural circuit in terms of uh, what happens during a reflex action. Let us look into that. Let us take an example of a reflex cell. So the sensory information, you know, if you just, let us say, if you take this region, okay just below the knee, if you hit it, if you give a stimulus, the sensory information is conveyed to the central nervous system, okay. So that is something that will happen from the muscle spindle, there is this muscle spindle and there is this particular muscle which is this quadriceps or the extensor muscle, that is the top part, the extensor muscle. So from here, the signal will travel and it will come to the spinal cord. Now, once the signal is coming to the spinal cord, there are two things that are going to happen. One is that because of the reflex action, there will be another neuro, you know, neuron which will actually, it is the motor neuron, so this is the flexure motor neuron. So as the sensory neurons are actually bringing the signal, the flexure motor neuron will actually, uh, uh, sorry, in this case the extensor motor neuron. The flexor motor will come at just a later, later stage. The extensor motor neuron will take the signal back to the muscle spindle so that it will be able to pull the system. I told you that it actually pulls, okay. And as the pulls, the leg goes outward, okay. So the, the leg moves outward. Now, as this is happening, then you have to also make sure that the hamstring is ready about it, otherwise, the hamstring itself may actually oppose the motion, then it would not. So as you are pulling, the hamstring has to be kept ready, that it should not, uh, you know, respond to that. So that is where the, you know, the extensor motor, they would actually, once they get this uh, sensory neurons uh, signal, they would actually come into action and uh, the flexure motors, the flexure motors will actually uh, keep this part reduced in order to assist this motion. So once again, we have to keep in mind that first of all, the heating will generate signals in the muscle spindle which will be captured by the sensory neuron and that signal will come to the spinal cord. Once the signal comes to the spinal cord, then two things will happen. One is that the signal will travel through motor neurons, in this case the extensor motor neuron back here, which will actually pull this system. So that pulling is going to occur here, as I have shown you earlier, that it will be pulling. And simultaneously, a part of this sensing is going to an interneuron. This is the inhibitory interneuron, and this inhibitory interneuron is going to alert the flexure motor neuron system, which is, uh, which in turn will be working on the flexor itself to keep it ready in order not to oppose this motion. So this is the example of the reflex action that happens in the knee and that is what we call a knee jerk reaction in a system. Now let us look into a small video in which you would be able to see that how this knee jerking actually takes place. 
Hyperreflexia can be demonstrated in the patella reflex. Uh, in this case, the patient has suffered a stroke affecting the left side of the brain. Um, the patella tendon extends from below the patella, which is right here. Um, it's a broad band of tissue. It's easily palpable. If you're not sure where it is, have the patient extend their leg, which will cause the tendon to shorten. And you can strike directly on the tendon. And thus, reflexes are very brisk. Um, and in fact, there are a few extra beats of movement, which are referred to as clonus. Again, classic for an upper motor neuron syndrome. In cases like this, the reflex can be elicited by simply tapping on the tendon often. So you see the same reflex requires very little stimulus. Compared, again, with the normal side, patella tendon, again, extending from below the patella. Strike on the tendon. So well, that would be a normal reflex and certainly diminished compared with the side that's hyperreflexic. Now in this entire you know, reflex system, we have seen also two interesting things. One is called a convergence and another is called a divergence of neurons. When the sensor, sensory neurons are actually, so the sensory neurons, so when they are actually bringing the signal, so let's just you know, or just denote them as sensory neurons, okay. Uh, when they are bringing the signals, they actually put it into many neurons, so this is actually diverging. On the other hand, when the signal is after divergence, when it is coming through the motor neurons, so at that time there is a convergence of the signal that is happening. So this is the uh, motor neuronal system. So, you will see that in any reflex action, there is both convergence and divergence of neurons that is taking place. Now, if you look at it to uh, even more, uh, you know, minutely, you will see that there are two different types of circuits that are present here, feedback and a feed forward circuit. Now, what is the role of the feedback circuit? Well, let us say, for example, I told you that the uh, extensor muscles, okay, the afferent neurons are actually bringing the signal uh, to the soma uh, of the extensor motor neuron that now you have to pull this extension uh, muscle. Now, what if it uh, continuously starts to pull? There, it, it may actually harm itself. So, as it is pulling, the feedback is going and there is an inhibitory neuron Okay, which actually nullifies it beyond a certain level, it says enough, this is to be crossed. So, this is what is the feedback inhibition part, which actually judges up to what extent the excitation will be tolerated. On the other hand, there are quite a few feed forward inhibitions also. For example, you consider the same afferent neuron, which is actually innervating the uh, extensor muscles, the signal is coming. I told you that one part of the signal goes to the extensor motor neuron, the other part goes to the inhibitory interneuron. So, this is where it is going and this actually gives an inhibitory signal and that inhibitory signal now works on the flexure motor. So, the flexure motor, this negative sign actually goes and it actually informs the flexure that you have your role is secondary, you have to help the extension in terms of the reflex action. So, this is a feed forward that is directly going to the system, whereas this is a loop, so this is a feedback system. So, you will see both this type of feedback and feed forward circuits that are present in a simple neuronal circuit like reflex itself. Now, there are actually many, many different types of neuronal systems as you can see that uh, you have this uh, model neuron that we have worked on but there are the sensory neurons which essentially have this, it is like the bipolar neurons I talked about. Then the motor neurons are there uh, which directly works on the muscles and then there are interneuron which works between the neurons and then there are other types of projection type of interneurons, local interneurons and also there are some neuroendocrine cells also which actually works between the capillaries and 
uh, the next level of neurons. So for all of them, one basic model that you can simulate through this model neuron is that every one of them will be having some input. That input is coming like say some sensory input, it can come like that or it can come from a synaptic joint like that. So that's the input part. Then there is an integrative action that is happening inside the soma and then based on that there is a trigger and there is a conductive part that's what that conduction is taking part in this actional part. And then finally there is an output that output is in terms of certain chemicals that will be transmitted and the new receptor is going to take it. So a new receptor is going to take this, uh, this signal. Okay, so there are there can be many many such receptors there. So you can see that the signal is essentially electrical here. The signal is electrical in this region also, but whenever it is coming here, then it becomes actually a chemical signal. And that's are these are the four uh, the stages in which it happens: input, integration, conduction, and output. Well, in this lecture, I have given you an exposure to a neuron and how a neuron behaves. Now, we will go much deeper in the next lecture in terms of how the neuron transmits the signal. That is what we will be covering in the next lecture. Thank you.